Uh, I'm Travis Nielsen. Uh, I'm one of the original Rook maintainers, uh, creators. We started this project back in 2016, and it's been a great journey, uh, and so glad to be here uh, with you. Um, yeah, so I'll let each of the panel members introduce themselves as well. So Blaine? I'm Blaine Gardner. I'm uh, also with IBM. I've been a Rook maintainer for four or five years now. Um, a lot of focus on object store and some multi stuff and NFS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. It, it's on. Just, mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I'm Alexander Tros, founding engineer of Core Technologies Inc. I've been, uh, I don't know, six, seven years, something around that, I guess, nowadays. <laughs> Maintainer of the project as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And Deepika? Hey, uh, I'm Deepika Upadhyay. I work as a cloud storage engineer in Core Technologies, Inc. And uh, I used to work with uh, Redos uh, Core uh, Engineering Team uh, for two or three years. And uh, then I moved to uh, Redos Block Device, uh, worked uh, there for one year. And now I'm transitioned to work on Rook itself. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Yep. OK. Let's get rolling here uh, for, for our agenda today. So as, as a Rook panel, we want to, we're going to do things in a little different format. Uh, if you've been to a Rook talk before, who has been to a Rook talk before, just out of curiosity? A few people, OK. And maybe you've seen some of our recordings online, too. We've done a few of, of these. Uh, but our goal today is really to familiarize you with, uh, with storage for Kubernetes. You know, what does Rook provide? Uh, what does Ceph provide? And and ultimately, uh, the question I hope e each of you ask yourselves is, you know, is Rook a potential storage solution for you? Can, does it meet your needs? And we'd love to hear, hear any feedback for how it's working for you and, um, and what you might think it, we could add to it. Um, so at the, time, at the end of the meeting, we hope to have time for your questions. Uh, but the format will be, we'll present, we came with a list of questions. Uh, we'll kind of jump around to a, a number of different topics, um, but hope um, hope all these questions and answers uh, will be interesting. So, if you don't get time for your questions, we'll be at, we do have a Rook booth in the Project Pavilion, um, over in yeah that Pavilion area on the far far side of the conference, and hope to see you there. Okay, first question. So, how should someone new to Kubernetes think about storage? Blaine. Yeah, I love starting with this question. I think like uh, like a lot of answers, it's two parted. Uh, Kubernetes easily manages distributed applications, and for for a user, for the user side, for an application, the storage should just be easy. Uh, I want, you know, if my application fails over, if it scales out, then my, that storage has to follow my pod. This has to be across nodes, uh, across partitions, and that means for administrators. This like distributed aspect is uh, is pretty challenging. These are big shoes to fill. If I have external storage, who's going to manage that? If I'm using a cloud provider, am I locking myself in? Myself in? And if I'm going to run my own, can can I handle that? Uh, so I think I think this really segues well into the rest of the presentation. Right. Thanks, Blaine, for that uh, introduction. So as we started to explore storage for Kubernetes early in the Kubernetes days, uh, we had some questions that really led us to this project. Um, first of all, uh, as Blaine said, um, storage, we all, I mean, we all have to worry about it. Um, it's, it's all in our mind. Storage is commonly provided by cloud providers, but if I'm not running in a cloud provider, uh, what about storage in my own data center? Um, and even if I am running in the cloud, there are certain limitations that we'd like to overcome. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then at the end of the day, Kubernetes really doesn't treat storage as a first-class citizen. Uh, it's external. You have CSI drivers to connect to it. Um, but why not manage storage as any other Kubernetes application? Why shouldn't it be running natively as part of my Kubernetes cluster so I can manage it with the same tools that I'm managing other applications? And, and then the next question is obviously, well, which storage platform can we trust? Uh, enterprises uh, don't generally um, go full on board with a new data platform. They want a data platform that's been proven. It's been running in, in production for some time. Uh, data is sensitive, sensitive. It's valuable. We have to protect it. 
So we made the decision, uh, first thing, to build on Ceph, and we'll talk more about why we did that and um, what it provides. So what is Rook? Alexander? Yeah, so Rook, I think most people of you have heard about an operator, maybe I guess. Who knows what an operator is? <laughs> okay. I still have, a t I think, two slides or so to really quick catch everyone else up, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so what is Rook? The idea in the end is with Ceph being, well, quite a complex system in itself as well. One might see this even more complex as Kubernetes. Um, Rook is basically there to make it at least easy to run and to some degree maintain. There are simply certain aspects as well to just catch that as well, which um, you can't just have an operator take care of, there's certain settings in Ceph, the same with Kubernetes, there's certain tweaks you can make to make it more responsive, for example, to node failure. Failure, the same applies to Ceph from Rook as well. But the point is that we have custom objects for which we can uh, easily, for example, upgrade your cluster. If you just change the CRD with the new version, operator sees that, takes care of that. I'll go into that in a second as well. And the integration, for example, the Ceph CSI driver, Rook sets that up so that you can immediately start using the storage in the cluster. Or even for object storage, you have the uh, currently, um, what is it called again? Object storage claim, right? Mm -hmm. uh, object bucket claim. Object bucket claim, exactly. Where if you need S3 for an application, it's kind of the same concept as like a persistent volume claim at the moment. Um, these things, that's what Rook takes care of and like sets up in your cluster. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Did you comment about open source? Uh. It's open source, <laughs> Apache 2.0 okay. license, yeah. Perfect. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, you have your yeah. orchestration. So an operator, you know, orchestration, um, at the top, I guess the example that I would simply like to use there if you go one further, we yeah. have the custom object, the operator it observes it, detects any changes or any deviation from the desired state, Reconciliation loop, if anyone wants to kind of Google it, but that isn't too deep into operators yet, detects it, tries to see what it needs to do, and acts upon that. Just mm -hmm. to have the operator kind of, that's what an operator does basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So Rook makes storage happen in your cluster with its operator. Uh, so just a quick note on what Rook's CNCF status is. Uh, we started our journey with CNCF uh, you know, early on. Uh, CNCF defined their uh, graduation status as, oh, you need to go through this process so that people know that, hey, this is, uh, this is a stable project. It's a project that the community trusts. It's a project that where we try to do the right thing for the community. It's not just a product we want to sell you. It's you know, what's right for the community. Um, so we are happy that uh, as of October 2020, we are a graduated project. Uh, so thank you for all your support and the community's support for making this happen. Uh, lots of people running in, in production. Uh, it's just been a great journey to, to get through, uh, through this. So, yep, just wanted to make that quick comment. So let's talk more about the, the Rook community, who's involved in it, and, and why exactly is this fo our focus. Uh, from the start, uh, we wanted to build a project that's open source. It's you know, what the community needs. Apache 2.0 license really gives us that. Um, that ability to just say, it's yours, deploy it how you need to. And we do have maintainers across four companies currently. Um, so with, you know, we're f us two from IBM and Core, uh, and a couple we don't have here in this meetings, Cybosu and Upbound. Um, so we, we really uh, are, we have a um, steering committee and maintainers and everything set up according to a good, you know, healthy CNCF project where we want cross-company collaboration. We have had over 400 contributors to the, to the GitHub project, and according to Docker Hub metrics, uh, 280 million container downloads now. So I guess a few people are using it. Uh, uh, just curious for a quick survey, uh, are you here to learn about Rook for the first time? A few of you? Okay, a lot of you, all right. Uh, how many have experimented with Rook? Okay, a lot, and who's deployed Rook in production? Great, a number of you, so wonderful. Anybody deployed it for longer than three years in production? 
A few, okay, yes. The, so awesome. So let's get into what is Ceph, why we chose Ceph, and uh, where that gets us. Deepika? Yeah, uh, can you move a slide ahead? Mm -hmm. So Ceph is, again, an open source project. It's around, I think, 10 plus years now for Ceph to be uh, kind of uh, in open source world, even being used in uh, production clusters, uh, one of the trusted uh, uh, product uh, in open source. It's It provides a kind of block shared file system as well as object store uh, all three um, at one place and uh, you can check out uh, for more details uh, ceph.io uh, it covers the case studies and uh, what is covered we, uh, we also have services like dashboard and monitoring uh, everything in place for ceph mm -hmm. thanks and, and maybe i'll just jump in and and add a translation to kubernetes terms so block storage, that's where you get your RWO volumes, read write once. Shared file system, you get your RWX volumes if you really need to share them. And then object, of course, um, that S3 endpoint. So thanks. And Deepika, why Seth? Yeah, so again, uh, as I said, uh, uh, why somebody should use Ceph? Uh, so just moving to that, it provides an all-in-one unified solution for uh, block file and object storage. And uh, along with that, um, again, 10 plus uh, years of it being used, uh, many production clusters uh, and case studies. You can check that out. Uh, it was first released in July 2012. And yeah, my favorite one is it's being used in CERN and uh, in Large Hadron Collider project as well. And uh, it's working quite efficiently there. We also have talks around it in an uh, event called Cephalacon. It was co-located with KubeCon. So uh, if you are interested in learning more, you can check out Ceph talks Cephalacon from Cephalacon to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. right. Thanks, Deepika. Uh, next question. Does Rook support storage providers other than Ceph? Uh, so early on uh, in the Rook project maintainers, uh, we wanted to do what was right for the community. And so we explored this question and put quite a bit of effort into it. We, uh, we did explore uh, several providers, and you know, MinIO and CockroachDB and uh, a number of them and NFS. And what we tried to create a, a common framework where we could bring them all together and share something, kind of like you've got the operator SDK for creating operators. You know, could we create some sort of storage operator SDK? And at the end of the day, what we found was that, um, well, Ceph today is, is the only storage provider that we support. Um, the, the truth of it was that the other ones either had their own community or we just didn't have the community support uh, come to join Rook. And so we've, you know, those projects have all uh, split off. They've got their uh, separate operators and Rook's focus is really on Ceph. And since I grew up with Star Wars, um, I just have to say the, strong, the force is strong with Ceph. Um, and Yoda's helping us out here, so, okay. How stable is Rook? Uh, just a few comments on that. We've already uh, said some things. So we're in our third year since CNCF graduation. Uh, it was about five years ago we declared uh, Rook stable for production, and yeah, we have had several long-time users using it for that long, which is just a great testament to you know, how, how Ceph does provide that enterprise uh, quality storage. Uh, we have many upstream users. I wish we knew how many upstream users. The nature of the upstream is go use it and we just don't know about it. Um, we should do a survey at some point and try and uh, get some more of that feedback. We just haven't for a while. And then also there's there are products built around uh, Ceph and Rook um, downstream that you know, we don't have metrics for either. So anyway, it's out there. It's in production. Uh, people are using it. I uh, just wanted to give one case study. I was uh, chatting with someone from the Rook community that has been using Rook for uh, at least the past five years, working with the National Research Platform uh, based on um, National Science uh, NSF funding. Anyway, he just said, yep, I've got a cluster with three petabytes, 200, almost 240 OSDs, for those familiar with Ceph. Uh, it's a pretty big cluster. Uh, bigger clusters do exist, uh, but six petabytes of storage, it's, that's not the limit by any means. It's just uh, an example I wanted to show that, yes, you can deploy large, large storage platforms with this. And I just asked him to say, hey, what can you say about Rook for future users? And I just appreciated his, his quotes here. Rook significantly simplifies our persistent storage needs in Kubernetes. 
by automating Ceph, essentially. And then with Rook, adding and using a new Ceph cluster requires almost no efforts and becomes a trivial task. And that really comes back to this model of how Kubernetes does things where it's desired state. You tell the Kubernetes what we want it to look like, and then Rook makes it happen with our operator. Uh, you can codify it, you can put it in your Helm charts, your YAML, and anyway, just make it happen. And if you need to deploy multiple of them, you can replicate it very easily. Uh, on to next, how do you install Rook? Uh, Blaine? Um, yeah, first of all, the Rook operator, the uh, Ceph cluster, they do have Helm charts. Uh, we have, especially for more common and complex configurations, we have example manifests. Um, but really going to the Rook website, which is rook.io, and clicking get started is the easiest way to kind of get in on the ground floor with Rook. Um, last year, uh, Travis and I gave a demonstration of installing, uh, installing Rook on a multi-node AWS cluster and this took about 12 minutes. Um, the link is not great, but it is in the PDF slides uh, for afterwards. Mm -hmm. All right. And in what environments can Rook be installed? Uh, yeah, in short, anywhere Kubernetes runs. Uh, this can be in the cloud, this can be on premises, uh, virtual hardware, bare metal hardware, um, and the underlying storage could be disks attached to my nodes. It could also be PVCs. And recently, uh, we've put in support for loopback devices as well uh, for testing. And with uh, the kind of key point to drive home here is that Rook really helps enable this cross-cloud support. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So what, what should I know, what should you know about the architecture? Uh, we just want to provide a, a brief overview. We don't have time to get into a lot of details here, but it's just important to know. So Rook is the operator, really owns the management of, of the storage in the cluster, the management of Ceph. At the next layer, we have the CSI driver, so the Ceph CSI driver, which then will provision and mount the storage uh, to your user application pods. So just as you may be familiar with other CSI drivers, that's the way Kubernetes defines that applications plug in their storage for RWO, RWX uh, volumes. Uh, the CSI driver can actually be used independently of Rook even, but it's just not as, as integrated as, so Rook just makes all of this integrated. Uh, and then Ceph provides the data layer. Again, back to this, Ceph already existed. It just wasn't built for Kubernetes initially, but Rook brings, it manages it for you, so you don't have to worry about all the details of getting Ceph going. But at the end of the day, Ceph provides that um, that hardened data layer. Uh, just a brief overview of what it looks like when you deploy Rook uh, after you have it running. So this is just a, a view of three nodes, a three node system with pods uh, color coded depending on those different three layers that I had in the previous slide. So the blue pods would be really what we call the Rook pods where you've got the operator that's uh, the brains of Rook uh, deploying everything. Uh, we have an optional discovery de component that helps find devices. And, and then the green pods uh, would be for the CSI driver. So there's a provisioner, there's the, the plugins. So Ceph RBD uh, is for those RWO volumes, Ceph FS for RWX. Uh, all those red pods are the various Ceph components. Ceph has a number of daemons to um, you know, provide the Ceph mons, provide a quorum. Uh, and the brains kind of like etcd, they are the brains of the system. The OSDs manage individual disks and store the data on disk. And anyway, lots of those components working together. And it, it's a lot to, if you have to deploy it uh, individually in Ceph, it's, yeah, it's more work manually, but Rook takes care of that for you. So that's just a brief look at that. We have more slides at the end, if, uh, or we can talk offline about more architecture if you're interested. So Alexander, how can we monitor Ceph once it's up and running? Well, who's heard about Prometheus? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, well, starting off with Ceph part to that. So um, Ceph itself has kind of like a dashboard built in. If anyone wants to look at it, it's, well, I think the more important point though, as I ask for Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Good. Oh, the next slide? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Prometheus metrics. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you have Prometheus metrics. What, like, what else 
I guess you want to hear. You have, mm -hmm. There's Grafana dashboards pre-prepared. You have the metrics. Alerts are also uh, available from, uh, well, Ceph mm -hmm. project. And technically, you can also even toggle the flag, and they will be automatically deployed in your cluster. You just need Prometheus operator for that. It's mm -hmm. We try to make it as convenient as possible there. So, well, Prometheus metrics. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just add that all these metrics come from s the Ceph project, the Ceph th that's been building in these metrics for, you know, since the early in the project, they're always uh, looking to add these metrics, make sure we can keep track of what's happening. So you know it's healthy. All right. Uh, how can I troubleshoot rug clusters? Uh, Deepika? So um, now uh, comes the question. Uh, I mean, Ceph is hard at times, and uh, Rook uh, tries to make life easier there. So uh, as uh, stated, we have troubleshooting guide available at uh, Rook uh, website, where we discuss uh, some scenarios uh, where you can, mm, I mean, uh, if there is some problems at the CSI layer, or if there are some problems uh, with uh, Ceph layer. Uh, we have scenarios covered. Most of the scenarios uh, that are common are documented in our website. And uh, yeah, you can also reach out to us on um, kind of uh, Slack channel, or uh, at last we can cover that. Um, but uh, we are available, and we are there to help you with the troubleshooting of Rook in general. Apart from that, there is an interesting uh, uh, thing uh, that we worked on. Uh, there is a kubectl uh, plug, uh, plugin uh, support called crew plugin. So we uh, kind of added the uh, rookcef support in it. So if you install uh, the crew plugin, you can uh, do everything that you uh, used to do or you can do uh, uh, with the Ceph layer. So any Ceph commands, you can uh, run that. You can check the Ceph uh, status from it. You can check the Rook status from it. You can check the status of the uh, CRDs, everything. And uh, all apart from that, uh, you can also uh, do the maintenance op operations. If uh, you think that Ceph is hard, uh, we are trying to make it easier with Rook uh, to provide advanced troubleshooting scenarios for Ceph in one line command by using this plugin. So if you run into any scenarios and you want a simplified solution to be available for, uh, we are working on the development of this project with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deepika. Uh, so how safe is my data in Ceph? Um, you, you, you put your data there. And I think, Blaine, you had this? Very. Very <laughs> safe. OK. Um, yeah, uh, Ceph is, uh, Ceph is de designed to be more consistent than available. Um, so this means that if, uh, if the data is not safe, Ceph will sometimes not work. But that is also one of its greatest strengths. Um, all of your data is chopped up in, into bits, into shards, and then thrown across your partitions, your racks, your nodes, your disks, so that any like single or even like two failures isn't going to erase all of your data. And uh, the amount of replication that you have is configurable. And f over the 12 plus years Ceph's been available, um, it's proven highly, highly durable. And even in really extreme disasters with the Rook, we've seen users recover uh, like with manual intervention. Mm -hmm. But for the crew plugin speaking, we're trying to add certain of these more complicated recovery steps as well that they are fully automated. And so in the worst case, you, like you still need to manually run a command, but that most things after that are just automatically done by a script that runs automatically using this, the crew plugin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very rare scenarios, but yes, okay. we want to make sure it just works. Um, all right, what Rook features are we most excited about? So we've, we've each kind of chosen a feature to talk about. We'll go through these slides now. I think, Blaine, you're first. Yeah, I'm here to evangelize uh, COSI, uh, which is the container object storage interface. Um, so this is effectively just the container storage interface, but for object storage. Um, so this allows pods to request and access buckets um, or blob storage if you're an Azure fan. And <laughs> uh, 
aims to make object storage as cloud ag agnostic as block and file have been for so long. Um, the alpha release of Cozy was in Kubernetes 1.25. We're continuing to make progress on beta designs. And in, in Rook, well, in Ceph, we have a, uh, a Cozy driver, and then we're working on adding that to Rook for our v1.12 release. Mm -hmm. right. um, one quick thing to add, as I mentioned, uh, the object bucket claims in the beginning, that's the better version. Uh, this is, is the better, better version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. Uh, Deepika. Yeah. Even uh, Alexander uh, covered uh, some scenarios uh, already about the disaster recovery uh, and um, in case of failure. But uh, for me, it's the crew plugin. It's simple. It's fundamental. It's solving the problem of uh, maybe having the expertise, Ceph expertise, if you um, are running a Ceph cluster. Rook is simplifying the uh, installation and maintenance and upgrading uh, a Ceph cluster aspects of it. But what about we, in rare case, get stuck in uh, some problems with Ceph demons? Uh, not everybody is familiar with it uh, at the first glance. So we kind of are automating uh, solutions. Uh, for example, there is a, a unit in Ceph called Ceph Monitors, which kind of uh, does the talking and uh, kind of maintains um, the kind of network. And uh, as in, um, it's important for them to be in quorum. And if even two of them are out, Ceph cluster is drastically affected. So uh, how to restore them by uh, just having one of uh, the good ones available? We have one line command for it. Earlier, we used to kind of have to do uh, manual intervention and uh, kind of bring back the monitors back from there. So those complexities with Ceph, uh, we are trying to simplify it with crew plugin. Uh, even uh, kind of have a debug pod where uh, it will have all the debugging tools that we use with Ceph available. So you can, it will uh, spin up a debug pod and it will have the uh, mon mo monitor debugging tool. You do the magic with the monitor debug tool and then you uh, kind of, um, ha after the debugging can again bring back the uh, normal pod and everything is run running smooth. You do not have to manually go and debug things, uh, along with kind of checking the status. And any kind of automation around Ceph, we can write our own code around it, simplify that for uh, Rook. So uh, for me, it's crew simple, and it's good for Ceph. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Topeka. Yeah, something else I'll add about the crew plugin is, you might ask, why do we need a crew plugin if we have an operator? And, and the pattern we really found is that the operator is really good at desired state operations, like make this happen. But there are just some operations that are, you know, you need to do something one time, you need to do some maintenance operation. And so the crew plugin is really where maintenance operations just make sense. Uh, just tell the operator to stop even sometimes for the, some of these operations and let us do this one time operation and then start up again. Okay, Alexander. Um, More encryption is good. <laughs> it's that simple for that yeah. part. M making the OSDs, which store the data in the end, be uh, encrypted as well, and that's happening automatically. Mm -hmm. More encryption. Yeah. We're keeping your data s safe and, s and secure. Um, yeah, I wanted to, the one that came to mind for me was really the ability to recover from disaster. We've already talked about it some. This picture is from a, a data center fire uh, that was in France, I believe, a couple of years ago that affected even millions of websites, something like that. Uh, was anybody affected by this fire? Uh, probably some of you, yes. Uh, not a good experience. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Ceph is fundamentally designed to run and span multiple data centers so that you don't have to even depend on a single data center. You can spread your data across, replicate it across multiple data centers. Um, and even if a whole data center survives, you can design it so that you can survive those, those outages. Uh, even at a, a simpler layer, uh, Ceph is designed to 
keep your data available while you have a loss of a node or individual disks to some degree. Uh, Ceph can even keep your data available and online and you won't even notice if it's down um, because it's because of those multiple replicas. And so be and then similarly kind of flipping around the title here instead of recovery of disaster scenarios it's the DR features which Ceph supports. So there's this is the ability basically to mirror your data across clusters. So if you have clusters across geographical areas, typically you'll want to say, oh, I want to mirror this data completely over to another cluster and even be able to have applications that uh, are smart enough to fail over as well uh, in those disaster scenarios where a whole data center goes down and you can just have the live data ready to go you know, uh, in, in that configuration. Um, so those, each of those mirroring um, technologies, it's a, it's a whole topic to dive into that we don't have time for today, but those are there. Uh, so what if I have a Ceph cluster deployed outside of Kubernetes? Can I connect to it from Kubernetes? Well, yes, you can. <laughs> if you have an existing Ceph cluster, Roo can basically connect to it, take care of setting up the CSI driver or even in certain, well, there's different modes to accessing an external cluster from Rook's perspective to, for example, even start running certain components of a self cluster in your Kubernetes cluster. And mm -hmm. it's, for the most part, as simple as that. Like, you give the operator the credentials for the other cluster, tell it where it is, and for the main part, for the CSI driver, at least configuration, that's taken care of. And if you have RJW in the other cluster as well, that's mm -hmm. happening automatically as well in regards to the object bucket claims. and future cozy and you can kind of think about it as well if you have a Rook Ceph cluster that you want to share with multiple Kubernetes clusters you can do that as well the only point that's kind of like the maybe a bit obvious to some people but because one Kubernetes cluster can't directly talk with the network of another Kubernetes cluster you need to interconnect them and there's several ways either you have a CNI which allows you to do that there's a what was it called? I think like, um, Cilium. Well, yeah, well, Cilium, for example, with the mesh, yeah, there's other projects as well that mainly focus on just bridging Submariner. two clusters that even have overlapping yeah. networks. Uh, Submariner um, is uh, another one. Yeah, that one. Um, and um, for those cases as well, we're looking more and more into them as Submariner, mm -hmm. for example, um, to make that mm -hmm. easier as well. Okay. As Yep. Real quick, just regarding like the one central, for example, Rook Ceph cluster, that's one way some people do it as well. They have one central Rook Ceph cluster for the storage, because again, with the aspect of Kubernetes abstraction, making it quite easy to run Ceph, like a mon fails, pff, just start up a new one. It's that easy for mm -hmm. something like Kubernetes to do that. It, but in like a real world Ceph case, you don't necessarily have additional nodes where you can just install a component on it. You can do that, but it would most of the time involve manual work. And that's again where mm -hmm. Kubernetes has this abstraction layer with an operator on top shines. Mm -hmm. All right, so can I provision a bucket with an S3 endpoint? Uh, yeah, I feel like this is something we've mentioned and alluded to before. Um, so the, the current implementation we have for um, creating a bucket and getting access to it in Rook uh, is with object bucket claims. And this is a similar pattern to PVCs. Um, the bucket gets created when you request it, you get access via a secret. Um, this is, this really ended up kind of being a, a prototype and is still in, in an alpha API uh, for what became Cozy. It sort of morphed into now Cozy, which is a Kubernetes special interest group. And I'm, Excited that Cozy is finally, finally, uh, mm -hmm. almost really here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. Can Rook be configured for clients to access storage outside the cluster? Um, so in other words, you have Rook running and you have clients not a part of this Kubernetes cluster. Um, Alex? Yes. Yes. <laughs> You need to, again, you need to have connectivity from the outside clients with the cluster. So host network modes um, or Maltus even as like a bit of a more and more preference as you can be 
pretty specific about like what network interface or even what network ranges you want to be uh, added to the Ceph component containers. Um, as with most things, you need to be able to reach it to access it. And for example, just to elaborate a bit more on like what you would need to make accessible depending on like the storage type. For example, for block storage, you would need to expose the monitors, uh, the uh, OSDs as well. So there's not just one component. It's not like you have a gateway to access certain types of storage unless for, well, for the basically object storage gateway, which is a different case though, because we would, for example, for that case, just expose it via an ingress node pod service as it, as it's S3 API. It's basically HTTP slash HTTPS, whatever you make it there. Um, mm -hmm. But for example, also for the file system type storage, the client also needs direct access to the OSDs, the MONs, and even another component, the MDS, the metadata service. Mm -hmm. But with, yep. well, host network, kind of the quick way to do it, multis the more specific way to do it, you can achieve that. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. I think we're down to the last couple of questions here real quick, and then hopefully we'll have time for your questions. Uh, how does Rook keep data available during Kubernetes upgrades? Uh, just to skim over this, uh, Rook does manage uh, pod disruption budgets so that even during a Kubernetes upgrade where nodes are taken offline, we make sure that uh, the nodes are managed so that Ceph stays completely available. Your data is all available, not just durable, but available during these upgrades. Uh, uh, how often does Rook have releases? Uh, we try to have minor releases on a similar cadence to what Kubernetes has about um, every four months. We just had 1.11 uh, in March and uh, potentially 1.12 will be in July. But whenever there's a need for a patch, uh, we try and get those, those out as, as soon as we can, biweekly, uh, at least just to have that cadence. And when there's a critical need, we always get patches out uh, as soon as we can. Uh, fun question, where did the Rook name originate? Uh, Castle was the original project name. And a castle is a secure place where we wanted to secure data. So that's, that's where the theme came from with the you know, the knights in shining armor protecting the castle. And, and of course, Rook is the chess piece representing the castle. So just a little fun background there. Uh, is Rook your next move, right? Um, so now we'd like to open it up for your questions. Uh, I think we have a little time, yep. Orange, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, as I totally new to, to this uh, Rook or any other solution like uh, Rook and Ceph, uh, uh, I have multiple questions, really, really brief. NFS support, first of all. Mm -hmm. Then, the, as I've seen that the architecture is pretty distributed, so there are a lot of components around. The resource footprint would be, would be nice to know because it looks like, I mean, many components could be also many resources. I mean, depends mm -hmm. if, uh, if the storage is critical mission critical for your application, for your uh, project or company or not. Mm -hmm. And the last one would be something like, w why should I, taking into account that I don't know anything about, about, about storage in Kubernetes, what, why should I choose uh, Rook and Ceph over other solutions like maybe MinIO or something mm -hmm. like that? Okay. Thanks. Rook, do you want to take NFS first? Yeah, I, I can take the NFS one, uh, definitely. So. Uh, Rook Ceph does have NFS uh, support, uh, at least from a, a basic cursory level. And I'm actually on a team and we're working with uh, Ceph folks to make the NFS support more kind of enterprise standard as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for another question, why do people? Why should people choose Rook over something else? I'd say the, the biggest reasons I hear from people is that you have block, object, and file all in the same storage platform instead of getting a different solution from different platforms. And then, and it's fully open source. Uh, you know, Ceph belongs to the Linux Foundation. It works with the CNCF, fully open source, open community. We're open to contributions all the time. And then I think I had one more question. Which one? Is it? Resource footprint. Um, yeah, I mean, Ceph is definitely, uh, requires some resources. And for example, each, for each disk that the Ceph needs to manage, we have say four gigs of memory. And so there, and some CPU to go along with that. It, it would take some time to dive into how many resources, but yes, it does require um, some non-trivial resources to run storage. Mm -hmm. All right, here in front. Yeah. 
So I have also <laughs> three questions. Uh, one, one is uh, about upgrading. Uh, what do you recommend? Always uh, upgrade Rook first and then Kubernetes after, or take a snapshot before <laughs> to, to be uh, better safe than sorry? Or is it mm -hmm. possible? And, and the other one is about uh, encryption. Uh, as I know, DM crypt, it's only for block device. It's also possible for object storage. Yeah. So Who wants it? Do you want to handle the DM crypt one? Yeah. So okay. um, for the OSD speaking, as that's where the data is stored, even like for object storage, that's the kind of like the from an architectural view how uh, Ceph works. Those object store demons, RGW. Uh, also just store the data into the OSDs. So the OSDs need a block device, be it, well, a loop device or a disk j or just a partition. It's basically where the data is stored in the end, yeah. So that's what the encryption there is, basically. And that's where the encrypt comes into play as, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Did you have the other question? Or um, um, well, re yeah. re regarding upgrading, um, oh, upgrading, it's yes. more for like a question, for example, the last time, um, I think, what was it again? The pod security policies went away in like mm -hmm. 124, 25 or something. And uh, if you didn't upgrade Rook before, or at least disable the option for pod security policies in the chart, you wouldn't be able to upgrade any further, but that's more of like a Helm, how Helm does upgrades, so to say, issue. Um, but it's well, and as far as keeping your data safe during upgrades and should you be worried about it and take snapshots first, and you, you can do that. I mean, snapshots are probably a good idea to have take periodically anyway, just you know, to, to sleep better at night, right? You always want as many uh, to keep your data as, as safe as possible. It is safe with Ceph. Uh, having backups to the, the backup is, is even, it's always good, right? Um, but I'd say whether or not to do it before upgrades or or after or worry about it. I'm, I'm not sure I've heard that as a significant reason to need to do snapshots first. The upgrades have been reliable from, uh, from what we've seen. And, uh, and we always, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's a decision you can make if you, need, if you feel like you need to do snapshots. Um, but yeah, good question. Uh, others? Um, sure, right here. Um, what about performance? Oh, back here. Um, performance compared to other things. Um, so Ceph is a software-defined storage network. Um, so it's going to be, it's distributed. It performs well when there are a lot of clients uh, communicating with uh, all of the demons that are spread you know, spread across the, the cluster. So you can get that nice distributed performance. Uh, as far as how much performance you get, it's going to depend on, well, are you backing the, the cluster with SSD or NVMe? Um, how how good's your network? Uh, it is since it is software defined storage. You're not going to get the same um, local volume access as if you're just writing directly to a disk, right? Because there is a layer in between it. But uh, people for who need that software defined storage and the consistency and the durability, uh, there um, uh, everybody would always love more performance, right? But there is a performance cost there that. But people are generally, it's acceptable for performance, uh, for what they need. Okay. Databases is where I'd say it's uh, more of the challenge where the higher performance needs are, right? And so, and databases sometimes have the replication at their layer too. So in those cases, uh, I'd usually tell people, you know, look at, just keep the, the replication at the database layer and not use that, just use a local disk. But, all right. J just from a performance, maybe a Deepika? Uh, you could yeah. have so, uh, add some insights from RBD side for block storage. Like that's one of the most common use cases for well, also people running databases on Ceph. Yeah, um, I think uh, yeah. so. You have to also see that there is replication and uh, consistency uh, being um, kind of uh, worked out in Ceph in general as well. But uh, still, I think I would say uh, if you are using NVMEs. Um, I do not recall, but uh, uh, Alexander, do you recall? I generally, but Regarding it was uh, performant enough uh, for HDDs. I was able to see uh, 100 MBs per second for three replicas. But there are numbers. You can actually use a tool called uh, uh, Redos Bench. 
uh, you can uh, go to uh, Ceph website and uh, kind of if you want to uh, see how uh, uh, your disk is performing, uh, you can use. Um, um, there is a uh, FS. Uh, uh, what tool we use? Uh, FIO. Uh, what? FIO. FIO. Sorry, uh. FIO. Uh, on your regular disk and uh, compare it uh, by kind of using, there is a RBD um, extension for that. It's ho uh, completely de documented in Ceph. So uh, you can run FIO directly on your disk and uh, then also uh, run FIO with RBD and uh, try to compare um, how it's performing. And those numbers are also published on Ceph website. So you can check that out. Okay. Well, thanks. I know there's a lot more questions out there. If, if we'd be happy to talk to you after and come to the Rook booth in the pavilion. But I think we better stop there officially. Thanks, everyone. All right.